Are you a thoughtful leader? Maybe you are. Maybe you think you are. Let's find out. I'm Mindy Gibbons Klein. I'm author of The Thoughtful Leader and host of The Thoughtful Leader podcast. Thoughtful leadership is all about thought leadership that goes above and beyond. Thought leadership that is truly new and original, exciting, disruptive, maybe even groundbreaking. Because let's face it, we need to raise the bar. My guests and I are absolutely obsessed with finding truly original thought leadership. And I'm going to bring you so many exciting ideas and opportunities, things for you to think about and chances for you to push your thinking that you'll be very glad you tuned in. So thanks so much for checking out Thoughtful Leadership and the Thoughtful Leader podcast. I look forward to connecting with you very, very soon. Welcome to the show. My guest today is the amazing thoughtful leader, Carol Seward. Hello, Carol. Hi, Mindy. Thanks for inviting me. Hey, this is going to be a great conversation because almost my whole background is in marketing, but you are the absolute expert uh, in terms of up-to-date, leading-edge thoughts about marketing and putting yourself out there. So everybody who listens to us, they want to promote themselves, market themselves. So uh, I'm looking forward to a nice conversation with you. Right, me too. Good. So tell us a bit about your background and how you got to where you are now, because I know you have deep expertise in this area. Okay, so I started off as a marketing trainee for an American company, Texas Instruments, and uh, having studied uh, a degree in management with a marketing module in the last year. So I wanted to focus on marketing. Um, And from Texas Instruments, I went on to doing um, public relations. And I came to London and worked for a lot of tech clients. And I did that for a while on the agency side. And then I decided that I wanted to go in-house and see things from the other side of the fence and be a client. So I went to the Financial Times and I ran the PR department there, uh, which was great because uh, not only was I doing something completely different, so I was promoting a newspaper, not tech clients, um, and also I was in a completely different environment as well. So it was great. It was a lot of event organising, a lot of high profile things that we we got up to. Then, you know, all good things come to an end and things change. And then I decided to take the plunge and go self-employed. So I was carrying on doing PR and I had my own PR clients. And then I just got to the point where I didn't want to talk to another journalist. I just woke up one day and I thought, I don't want to do any more PR. And there were, there's kind of three elements to PR, if you break it down. There's, there's the selling in stories to journalists. There's the event organizing, you know, uh, client events, press launches, that kind of thing. And then there's the writing. And I decided that I was going to focus on the writing. So I said goodbye to my PR clients and I took a big breath and I thought, that's it, right, I'm going to do what I want to do, focus on the writing. And of course, copywriting is very different from PR writing. The PR writing is many things like press releases and case studies and stuff. Um, now I'm talking, this is back in 1999. So, you know, I started as copywriter over 20 years ago. And um, it was very different then because, you know, we didn't have email campaigns like we do now. We didn't have um, e-marketing newsletters like we do now. Uh, web writing was in its infancy. You know, so there's been lots of learning all, of, all the way along, you know, the, um, the road. That's what I really enjoy about it is the fact that I'm I'm always learning new things because things change. You know, we didn't hit we, what was the word lead magnet, you know, back in 1999. No one had heard of that. So the kind of things that I, I do. So I help clients with their marketing messaging. So this is before I even start to write a single word. Um, I help them with their marketing messaging. So they they are clear on what they want to say and who they want to say it to, because sometimes they're not that clear on who their target customer is. Um, so I help them define all that. And I also help them with their tone of voice. So, they, so they're clear on how they want to sound when they come across. Um, and sometimes, you, for example, if you get two law firms or any two firms merging, they actually create a brand new entity. 
So they they have a new brand look, but they also need a new way of sounding. So I can I can help them with that. And then we get on to the, the actual writing. So I help them with like web writing, with email campaigns, with newsletters, all anything to do with, with marketing, really, marketing writing. That's my thing. So uh, the kinds of companies I help are, are corporates, um, law firms, financial services, a uh, whole range, really. So that's, that's a sort of quick summary of what I've been up to over the years. Yes, as I say, deep expertise, and uh, it's definitely coming out. What is the aspect of your job that you like the most? So I heard you talking about um, getting the message, getting the tone, getting the writing done. What really drives you about this work, Carol? The thing I like best is actually helping people right at the very beginning define what they want to say, because if they get that wrong... Then everything else goes goes wrong, you know. And um, and also, I'm I'm helping them with the what I believe is the most important bit of the marketing message, which is the words, because a lot of people, um, you know, they spend budget on getting the beautiful design right for their website and lovely photography, but they think, well, we'll save money and we'll write it ourselves. And they don't realise that just because they write reports or they, they, you know, dash off lots of emails to people, actually copywriting is something that you're trained in and it's a skill that you hone and you have to do lots of practice to get it right. And it's not something you can dash off yourself if that's not your background. So that's one of the things that I really enjoy is, is helping make a difference. When you see the before and after, you know, because, you know, the, the point is, if the home page, you know, it might look wonderful, but if it, if the message isn't clear or if the message is just off the mark, then people are going to very quickly click away and not visit you again. So that's where I think I can make a difference. That's where you do make a difference. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure the road hasn't always been easy. I love the way you tell this story. And, you know, I just decided that I didn't want to talk to journos anymore. And I, I decided I loved the writing and that everything's all rosy. Tell us about an issue, problem or challenge that you had that you've overcome. But when you look back, it's like, wow, I dealt with that. It could be in, in the business it could be anything else you want to talk about, but we like uh, kind of getting into the weeds here in this podcast. So, yeah. Oh, well, I'm, like most self-employed people, because um, I've been a sole trader the whole time, like most self-employed people, we have loads of challenges thrown at us, you know, and I've, I've had lots over the years. And, you know, a lot of these are beyond our control. For example, when there's a recession, you know, the, the financial crash back in the late 2000s, the pandemic last, this, well, we're still going through it, um, you know, clients get very nervous. And one of the first things they cut is their marketing budget. And so, you know, last year, I just have, I had projects cancelled left, right and centre or put on hold for later in the year. And, you know, there's nothing you can do about that. You can't sort of magic up budget that's been cut. Or other challenges I've had to overcome are when, a client decides that their policy is now, we're not going to outsource anymore. We're going to bring everything in-house. So, you know, I may have written for a client for many a year and then they suddenly realise, what we're going to do this now internally. So, again, that's the end of that one. (laughs) And then, you know, another thing that's happened to me is when a client I was writing for went into into liquidation, uh, owing me money. So how do I overcome those challenges? Well, there's there's three ways, really. First of all, you have to build up lots of resilience, you know, and I've overcome these problems before. I can overcome them again. Secondly, I make sure I have um, a good buffer fund of reserves to draw on if suddenly clients disappear through no fault and no, for no reason. Um, and then thirdly, I make sure that my marketing activities are always ongoing so that, you know, when one door slams shut in my face, I'm doing activities in the background to, to help other doors open. So um, that's how I overcome my challenges. Well, that is uh, realistic and very positive. And I'm sure a lot of listeners will relate to at least one of those stories, but, you know, have some hope 
that you do have these skills and, you know, listen to Carol because she has lots of experience and a very wise lady. So the, um, <laughs> the fun thing that we like to talk about here, and I'm sure you know this from the format of the podcast, but we like to ask if there is a common misconception people have about you. So this, this is where they think one thing about you but it's not true. And, and these tend to be fun stories. I don't know if you have one that you can share with people. Yeah, I don't know if it's so fun, but um, quite often, because I'm a business to business writer, people often think that I write anything to do with business. So, um, you know, they might ask me for, you know, to write an annual report or a white paper or long format article or something like that but that's not what I do I, I write more sales related stuff which I mentioned earlier was you know web copy email campaigns newsletters brochures that kind of thing so that's that's the main thing they think I'm a writer therefore I must write anything okay well I'm I'm delighted to hear that you have niched because that is apparently the way to go and you know we're super niched here at the thoughtful leader also at the book midwife it's hard because you say, oh, I'd really like to help lots of different kinds of people, but actually you're doing them a disservice if you don't focus. So I do hear you. One of the things that uh, always surprises me about our guests is that they have so many other things going on in their lives. And, you know, this is, we want to get to know the person people buy from people. So what would you like to tell the listeners about yourself that doesn't have to do with business? Oh, wow. Well, let me think. Well, I am very keen on keeping fit. But when I was at school, I was, I was very lazy when it came to sport because uh, it, everything we had to do seemed freezing cold, you know, playing hockey or netball. It was, you know, it was always cold. And um, I just I was never interested in it. But then, you know, when I started work, I realized that I really wanted to keep fit, but I didn't want to play stuff like tennis or hockey, whatever it was. Um, so I, I got into dance. And in my 20s, I, I did. I was quite often at Pineapple Studios doing classes. And I just uh, then I got into joining a gym and got into swimming. Um, and then I was started doing all these different things that I hadn't done before because it was all on offer at the gym so I started Pilates and I you know so I I now do I now do exercise I would say at least five times a week and I tend to do it I get up an hour early because people say to me how do you fit it all in and I said well I I set my alarm for an hour earlier and that's and I do it first thing in the morning and then I know it's done because sometimes the day can overtake me and then you know six seven o'clock in the evening I don't fancy doing exercise so Last year was a slight challenge in as much as, of course, the gyms and swimming pools shut. So I was determined to carry on with my five times a week, especially as we were stuck at home and we weren't able to, you know, just walking to and from tube stations and going to client meetings and back. It's surprising. It is surprising how many steps you do. So I wanted to kind of up my exercise because of that too. So I'm very lucky in that I live very near to an old Victorian cemetery. In fact, we can see it from the back of our flat. And that's very popular for dog walkers and joggers because it's got lots of little paths and a big wide avenue and um, stuff like that. So I just um, got my Spotify playlist <laughs> and um, selected a whole load of uh, kind of fast tracks that I wanted to exercise to. And I was just sort of whizzing around doing that. And because I know about Pilates, I was able to do my own thing at home. I probably didn't push myself as much, you know, as a, as a teacher would, but I managed to um, to carry on with my five times a week. And also, you know, a, a mutual friend of ours, Vicky Bauman, I started doing her yoga classes because she started doing them online. And I'm now doing those twice a week with her. I've never done yoga in my life before. And I'm amazed, actually, how much progress I've been making in the, over the past 12 months. So... So that's a little thing about me. So. Oh, lovely. I'm sure you've inspired a lot of people listening. And, um, you know, when you're physically fit and the endorphins are running around, it just benefits everything else. So um, I've had periods of time in my life where I've kind of neglected or forgotten about keeping fit, but I've always felt better 
when I have remembered and made it a priority. And I also do first thing in the morning because it would not happen otherwise. <laughs> so I really would like to understand the thoughtful aspect of what you do. So you know that we believe that people should put more thought into everything they say and do, and your work fits right into that. What is it that really makes you think? Um, I'm not going to say makes you angry because I don't know what emotions it brings up, but where do you think more thought should be placed when it comes to the work that you do and your clients? I think people need to take a step back and and think about why they're doing it because um, they're too quick to just talk about themselves, you know, and we've all, we've all seen brochures and websites that just go, we talk about, we do this, we do that. And I call it, you know, client weeing all over the place. And, you know, I'm not interested in what a client does. I'm interested in how they can help me. You know, what is it they're offering? What, what are they selling? What service are they offering that's going to make my life easier? It's going to solve my problem. And they can't, if they took a bit more care and thought about stepping into their customer's shoes and seeing and understanding what they're going through, seeing the world from their point of view, putting the customer's hat on and just actually just making a a list about, you know, what are all the issues that they're facing? How can we help them? What is it that we offer is going to help those issues. And quite often that comes up, that brings up other ideas about, ah, we're not solving that issue. Maybe we should create a product or service that addresses that point. And then so just quite simply, it's turning, every time you see we and our, turning it into you and your. So it speaks to the reader when they read the page. And so that's one aspect. The other thing is, just to take time over what you're writing because you can't dash something off. I mean, I, I will write a first draft and then I will edit it and then I will hone it and then I will look at it again and I'll put it aside and look at it the next day because there's always things you can do to improve it. And when, when you know, when someone says to me, oh, can you do it by after lunch? Yes, I can, but I can do a much better job if I take time over it and and thought and come back to it the next morning and And then I realized, ah, yes, I could say it better this way. Um, And you can't do it like that if you dash something off. I totally agree with you. And that's our philosophy here. And yet people will do what they will do. So I'm glad that the ones who really get it, the ones who care, care enough to bring you in or learn the skills and do it properly. I don't know if web copy is a life or death situation. I mean, maybe in some cases, like healthcare companies, if they say the wrong thing and people take the wrong medication, or I don't know, I I can go off into my fantasies. I really need need to write more fiction, but uh, I digress. So the, let's just, as we finish up, talk about something that is uh, very current and that is social media. Now you haven't mentioned it, but I'm sure you have opinions about how people come across in their writing. And um, I'd love to hear those. And I know our listeners would love to hear what you'd have to say about writing for platforms such as Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever else. Yeah, well, I, um, I'm, I'm keen on social media and um, I use it on a regular basis. Um, so for example, when I do, I do top tips on a Tuesday, And I will promote those on Instagram. I will promote them on LinkedIn and on my Facebook page. I don't use Twitter so much these days. I used to, I mean, I joined Twitter back in 2008 when it was pretty new. And I was very keen on it then. But I'm more keen on Instagram now. But I have to say LinkedIn is my channel for me. That's where my audience hangs out. And I just think for for people... You just need to find um, which which platform is is right for you, obviously. And we can't be everywhere all over the place all the time. And I think it's important to, rather than just copy and paste everything, is just think about which platform you're writing for. Um, you know, I wouldn't put on LinkedIn what I'm going to put on my Facebook profile, for example. So, you know, each platform is different. And 
and people will, as I was referring to my previous point about dashing something off, and they often don't check for, for typos because they're quickly doing something, you know, on their phone and they press and send and, you know, there's, there's glaring errors. And, you know, everyone does it, but quite a few large companies who should know better, they do this on their, on their social media feeds and it's full of mistakes. And, you know, my big bugbear, obviously, is apostrophes because I have an alter ego that some people know about, which is uh, apostrophe woman. And so I've, I'm a real stickler for apostrophes. Um, of course, apostrophe woman hasn't, uh, her role is to go out and about and, and find signs in, sh- in you know, sort of shopping streets and stuff where apostrophes are in the wrong place. And over lockdown, um, apostrophe woman wasn't able to go out and about so much. So, <laughs> but, you know, um, I think big, I, I digress as well, but big companies should take a bit more care over the social media like tweets or um, Instagram posts that they do. And I know quite a few of them have outsourced it to social media companies, but their social media companies should have someone check their work. I always have someone check my work. Uh, it's normally my husband because I work from home. You can't proofread your own words. That's the problem. If you've made a mistake, you can't see it. You know, if I've written form instead of from, I can't see that because I'm word blind as I've done it myself. So I always get someone to check check your own work. That's my tip. <laughs> Brilliant tip. And uh, typos, you can imagine in our publishing company and, you know, the pressure that we have to put out perfect books <laughs> to achieve perfection, uh, that's always there. And occasionally things do slip through. I agree with you. We've run out of time, sadly. I could talk to you for hours about apostrophes and writing in general, social media, faux pas, and, you know, there's, there's plenty more. So. Listeners, if you have enjoyed this episode, and I'm sure you have, just look for Carol. The show notes are there. Her contact details are there. Connect with her and follow her tips uh, beyond this episode. And uh, I just have to say thank you so much, Carol, for sharing all of that wisdom that you have shared, which I know is only a fraction of what you know. Thanks for sharing with us today. Thanks, Mindy. It's been great. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of The Thoughtful Leader, and I hope it's inspired you to be more thoughtful as a leader in your business. Please consider subscribing and leaving a review. An important question for you. Do you want to create a culture of thought leadership in your organization? My best-selling book, The Thoughtful Leader, is available now on Amazon and many other sites in paperback, ebook, and audiobook formats. Please visit www.mindygk.com for more great content. That's www.mindygk.com. Speak to you again soon.